It's interesting that in a show that so many people are watching so closely, a much discussed scene from a trailer turned out to be something completely different than it looked like it was. Especially in an episode where the characters' connections to reality are strained to the point of seeming less reliable than they ever have. The scene in question is what was presumed to be the new character Jen foaming at the mouth because of rabies or some similar sickness. This would lead to her death, and that would present the group with more complicated decisions. Also, it seemed like a foregone conclusion that Nat would kill the moose to provide food for the rest of the winter, and that might spark debates about it being a reward from the wilderness entity to help soothe the dissonance from eating the queen bee. Neither of these situations materialized, which I think was a nice surprise, but that doesn't mean that the idea of an it wanting blood is off the table. Unlike Ben, I did not minor in Chalaxon, so there was a lot in this episode that got me thinking. Primarily the idea of not being able to know if what we're seeing is real. That sounds like a bad thing, but I thought it worked well. There was also a shift in the visual language to reflect this with some newish looking transitions and some optical clues for when something's going on with the characters. This was most apparent in Ben's flashback scenes. These fill in some backstory that after watching him abstain from eating Jackie with the rest of the group last week, feels like it's setting up his eventual ending. The story boils down to him being closeted, which we already knew, but we get a better idea of where where his head was at before the trip. His unwillingness to move in with his boyfriend Paul had strained the relationship. He used the team's great season and not wanting to let them down as an excuse, but his partner could see through that. The idea is that he was unable to be his true self, and now that he's stranded in the wilderness, slowly starving to death with the group of young women he described as vicious little monsters, he's imagining what his life could have been. His first vision seems like a real memory. In the middle of that, we see him hallucinate that scene with Jen foaming at the mouth, which emphasizes this new sense of fear he has as an outsider. The second vision is him imagining his life if he decided not to come. He goes to Paul to tell him he's decided to live his life how he was meant to. You see the news of the plane crash on TV and realize that none of this happened. And it's really just him in bed starving, thinking of how things could have been different. Towards the end of Misty's monologue, Travis goes to talk to him and we see that there's definitely something wrong. This all worked pretty well to make the character more interesting and give us a look at where things are for the survivors emotionally. It does feel like it's the stuff that will make his death hit all that much harder, but this show is known to swerve at times so we'll have to see how things develop from here. And while we're on the subject, pretty much everything pertaining to fleshing out the characters we haven't seen as survivors in the present time feels the same way. I am always in awe whenever I can see someone becoming someone else. It's not that hard. Bees and Blood were also near the top of the list of things I was thinking of because since we haven't spent as much time with her as we have with the other adult versions, we're still getting to know adult Lottie. And she's a little hard to figure out. On the one hand, she's a cult leader. But despite how woo-woo it all feels, it does appear that there's some sincerity inside of her in her trying to help her followers. And last episode, her retelling of the night Travis died seemed suspicious, but at the end of this episode, her reaction to her vision of the blood in the beehives hints that there's more going on below the carefully presented surface that we've seen thus far. None of it makes me rethink my overall impression, and I do sort of trust Nat's instincts, but it does make it feel like it's moving in a good direction. As I half-heartedly guessed in my episode 2 video, Ty didn't remember eating Jackie's face at the banquet, and she has a very different reaction compared to everyone else the morning after. She's mortified, and when Van confirms what they did, she vomits. Everyone else had some time to let it sink in. And because they all participated, they're able to more or less move on. Mari, who has been making it a habit of saying some pretty awful things, when she says, I guess no one wants breakfast, it feels pretty true to life. No one feels great about this, but what can they really say? They were hungry and food was provided. I'm sure this isn't the last they'll think about it, but in the moment, Nat decides to take her remains to the crash site, and Lottie decides that they should have a baby shower for Shauna. The episode title is Digestif, which is a drink you have to aid in digestion after you eat, and I suppose there aren't a lot of drinks to go around. 
Nat's trip to the plane isn't productive as far as bagging the moose, but there's some interesting character stuff going on here. These two weren't close, so it stands out that she's the person who wanted to do something. The idea that Jackie's lucky because she's free from the suffering the rest are in for, and her line, way to make everyone jealous of you one last time, were particularly effective. Seeing some of the reactions that are out there, I think a lot of people are talking about adult Shauna's monologue, which we'll get to in a bit which don't get me wrong was great and did a lot to start to bring that storyline into focus but I thought this act of Nat saying these words out loud just talking to her remains all by herself there nobody else to hear it or for it to matter it's just really a personal situation I thought that was one of the best moments of the episode there's also the point here that she refuses to drink the tea the fact that they're full for the time being brings up the idea of what else they might be hungering for Refusing the tea reinforces that Nat's fearful that Lottie can provide something to Travis that she can't, and that makes you wonder about how this moose will come to influence things going forward. In this scene, it seems more symbolic than anything else. A majestic albino animal that also happens to be huge and would provide a bounty of calories. Nat is in the unique position to track it down and kill it to secure their ability to survive the winter. If she were able to do that, it would prove her worth, something more practical than what Lottie's offering. But it's also this weird symbol, so it could lead Nat on her own spiritual journey if they wanted to go that way. It doesn't come up at the baby shower though, so we'll have to wait and see. The shower itself was mostly a bust after the initial excitement everyone had at the chance to get their minds off the cannibalism. But there were several interesting details that popped up along the way. In the conversation where the idea came from, Lottie told told Shauna that she won't hurt the baby and refers to it as a him. More than that, when Shauna questions her, it looks like she tries to play it off. But you get the sense that this is something that she believes to be true. The way she reacted made me wonder if she's having regular visions that we haven't seen and she's keeping them to herself. In this moment, Shauna seems receptive to what she's saying, but this will all fall apart later when she gives her a baby blanket with the symbol sewn in it. Nat thinks this is a creepy idea and objects, and we see some signs of division within the group. Nat's point is that they discovered it when they discovered the corpse in the attic. Lottie believes he was using the symbol for protection, so Nat reminds her that he died. Akila, Mari, and Misty agree with Lottie, saying that she's seen things, and Thaisa quickly interjects that she's not God. It looks like it could get heated, but then Shauna gets a nosebleed, and right after a drop drips onto the symbol, everything gets interrupted by the sound of birds falling from the sky all around the cabin. When they go outside, they see this kind of thing that can happen, but knowing that doesn't make it any less weird when it does. I thought it was strange when they were trying to come up with the rational answer of what might have happened that Misty declared that they knew that there was a lot of iron in the ground. And I had to think back to when this might have come up before. Four. Back in season one, when Thaisa had the plan that she wanted to try to hike her way out of there, and the group split up, they came across that red stream that seemed to fulfill Lottie's vision of a river of blood. Misty throws out the idea that minerals can change the color, and Ty instantly adopts that as the reason why it happened. And I guess that's what they're referring to here, is that they've all decided that this is confirmation that there's a lot of iron in the ground, and apparently this can confirm confuse birds to the point of them falling from the sky. I didn't do a ton of research, but wasn't able to find much evidence of this being a thing that happens either. What it makes me think of is their plane crashing in this particular place. But overall, the blood dripping on the symbol seems at the very least to be something that they'll be thinking about, and we see Shauna drop the blanket when she makes the connection. Lottie suggests that they should collect the birds, and she says it as they should gather its blessings. And we see the group split up again. Van, Mari, Misty, Crystal, Akila and Travis start to collect the birds and Ty, Nat, Shauna and everyone else head inside. The scene ends with a shot from the upstairs window which makes you think of the body they found there that the internet has taken to calling Cabin Daddy. 
To wrap things up in the 1996 timeline, we get some insights into Crystal and Misty's new friendship. It turns out that Crystal might be weird beyond just being an awkward theater kid. But I also think she's right that they should have listened to Misty and made some Jackie bone broth. After they bond over the fact that they kind of enjoyed eating human flesh, Crystal drops the freaky fact that this wasn't the first time she's eaten a person. It's not so much that she absorbed her identical twin in the womb, but the looks on her face when she's revealing this to Misty. When she was first introduced, I was worried that Misty might take her down a dark path, but this makes me wonder if they'll happily go down one together. I, I just want to hit somebody until they feel as bad as I do. I just want to hit something. I want to hit it hard. <laughs> Misty does a surprisingly good job with her monologue from Steel Magnolias, and it was interesting to see everyone who was skeptical sort of come around to it at the end. What jumped out the most was the look she had on her face at the end, though. It's not entirely clear where they're heading with this yet, but it seems like there's a spark inside of her that wasn't there before. As I mentioned, Ty was not awake during the feast, and this was a big surprise for Van. Perhaps so much of a surprise that she isn't subtle in reminding her partner that she ate the face. Later, when she gets up to sleepwalk again, Van tells her that she'll let her go if she can go along. We get some clues as to what's going on with Ty when this happens. She says she follows the one with no eyes when Ty lets her. So this alter version does exist completely independent of Ty. And we don't actually know if she sees the man with no eyes here, but she walks straight to a tree with the symbol carved on it. There she wakes up and tells Van she doesn't know who the one with no eyes is, which kind of feels like a lie. None of it's absolutely clear, but it does seem that she has no memory of what happened. And she also doesn't remember drawing the symbol on Simone's hand in the present day. Again, that's not exactly surprising since we've known that she does some strange things while she's sleepwalking. I was a little surprised that this thing that she's been seeing since childhood might be connected to the symbol. There isn't enough to even say that though, since we don't know what the symbol actually is. It's entirely possible that this man with no eyes isn't connected to it at all, but sees it as something that might help them get out of there. After the nurse asks her about what she drew on Simone's hand, she wipes it off and then goes into the bathroom where we see another one of these mirror situations where the reflection is doing its own thing. This time Ty eventually notices it too, and when she asks what it wants, it mouths the words go to her, and puts her hands over her face to indicate that she's talking about Van. Ty leaves the hospital after acquiring the keys to her campaign manager's car. We also see that she tries to call Jessica Roberts on the way out, who we don't expect will answer since, as far as we know, she was killed by Misty in the season one finale. This was all very intriguing, and I'm looking forward to her reunion with adult Van. The rumors had been that she'd show up in episode 4 and it looks like that will turn out to be true. I've been pretty forthcoming about the mixed feelings I get sometimes when it comes to the present day timeline. And this episode managed to deliver some of the best stuff we've seen there and some of the worst in one go. As much as I was looking forward to it, I thought Randy's interrogation fell flat and the whole setup and carjacking part of Jeff and Shauna's story was goofy. Both of these situations produce some things that are important, but some of the times when this show is trying to be funny, it just doesn't land for me. When it does, it does though, so I guess you take the good with the bad. The new dynamic duo of African Grey and Putting the Sick in Forensics did manage to get a clue about purple clothes and Fanta soda that will lead them to Lottie's compound though. There is a lot of potential in chemistry here, so I'm highly optimistic. I can't say that I understand why Misty lied to Walter about knowing Adam's mother. This seems like an unforced error that might come back on her, considering it should be fairly easy for someone like him to disprove. And remember, Callie couldn't find anything on the internet about him in the first place, so that might cause problems too. I find it curious that Walter seems to be loaded, that they made a point that he had money, and wonder how that's going to affect things. And also not sure why he referred to himself as a Moria already looking for a Sherlock, since those two are more like arch enemies than anything else. 
there are a lot of ways that this situation can go wrong, but you still kind of want to see this work out. And it all makes me wonder what she was thinking when she smiled after reading his text about their upcoming road trip. The Jeff and Shauna side of things also hit some highs, which was good to see because this had been dragging for me. Jeff's impromptu trip to Colonial Williamsburg was fantastic, as was the conversation about the strawberry lube. And her explanation about how she liked not knowing what would happen when she was with Adam. This is the exact opposite of what we see the teenage Shauna talking to Lottie about back in 96. It makes you wonder how much you actually know her in the present. Because based on what we see here, she's pretty out of control. After she takes the gun off the carjacker, Jeff is so shocked that he basically lets the guy get away with their minivan. Later, she goes and tracks it down to a junkyard, and we get to see a side of her that we may have thought was there, but we really haven't seen to this point. The owner of the junkyard makes the mistake of judging her to be what she looks like. He thinks that she's a scared housewife who would never be able to pull the trigger. She quickly gets him to reconsider this notion by explaining the process of peeling the skin off a human body in a way that you could only do if you had done it before. The whole thing is intense and definitely makes me believe that they're going to hunt and eat multiple people before they're rescued. She finishes off her speech by explaining that her hand wasn't shaking holding the gun because she was afraid. It was shaking because of how badly she wanted to kill him. The delivery makes an impression and she gets her minivan back, but it also feels like she was telling the truth, which makes this Shauna story in the present day a lot more compelling. Jeff wasn't nearly as successful in his foolish attempt to talk to Kevin Tan at the gym. The Sadekis are three for three as far as striking out while talking to the police. Kevin's telling Jeff about the affair would have been brutal if he didn't already know, and it was kind of funny that his source is Callie. The bottom line here is that this situation isn't going away, and Shauna's current trajectory of doing crazier things each week might add a dimension of danger to that. Going back to where we started with adult Lottie, apparently Nat has decided to stay on the compound rather than head back. Plot-wise, this isn't surprising, but it isn't clear yet why she changed her mind. If I had to guess, it's because she wants to figure out what Lottie's up to. She spends most of the episode lurking around while Lottie tries to integrate her with the group and get her to participate. They're still at odds with each other, just like they were back in the wilderness. And when Lottie shows her the beehive, she tells her a story that seems relevant to the time they spent there. She explains that in the wintertime, the other bees cluster around the queen and vibrate to keep her warm. She says that the first thing a new queen does when it hatches is sting all the other unborn queens to death. And says that that isn't brutal, it's natural. It's simply what has to be done. Otherwise, they all starve. This with all the antler imagery around the compound makes it sound like it's all alluding to her time as the antler queen. If you think about the team's hive dynamics, they failed to protect Jackie, their de facto queen, from freezing to death in the winter. A lot of the teens then start to look at Lottie as her replacement, with the obvious exception of Nat. So this comes off as her justifying some of her decisions or actions in the period of time that we haven't seen yet, the in-between time. It's a neat story, but it kind of just comes off as more new age culty vibes from Lottie until the end of the episode where they add another dimension. As this week's Tori Amos song, Bells For You, plays, and we hear the lyrics, can't stop what's coming, can't stop what's on its way, Lottie returns to the beehives to find them all dead. When she opens the box, Simone Kessel does a terrific job of conveying the complex emotions that she's experiencing when she pulls out one of the frames and sees it's covered in blood. As she's looking at her hands and trying to figure out what happened, we hear a voice say, Il vous êtes du son in French. When she turns to ask this follower what she just said, she realizes it was all a vision when she repeats her question, Are you joining for lunch? Lottie looks spooked and the episode cuts to black. When you think about Lottie in French, you think back to the seance from season one. While they were having that, she started saying something very similar to, if not exactly this same phrase. Jackie points out that Lottie was bad in French class, so the fact that she's speaking the language is surprising already. And even though Jackie was bad at it too, she manages to translate what she was saying to either he or it wants blood. 
the beehive vision feels slightly different than the vision she had when Travis was dying because she's just here alone at the compound and the idea of it wanting blood seems to really shake her up. Is this because of things that happened in the past or is this her being afraid of what she might do? The fear she's experiencing is in stark contrast from the image she's projecting to her followers. For me, this works to make the adult character feel essential to everything that's going on. And I'm looking forward to learning more about how she deals with these visions she's having. In the past, there was a sense that she saw things before they happened. So what does that mean in relation to this vision of death and the idea that it wants blood? I can't wait to find out in the rest of the season. I thought that this episode felt like things were starting to settle in for this new season. The Ben flashbacks felt a little more disconnected from what's happening than the ones that we've seen from the girls throughout the show, but I guess that makes sense since he was never really one of them. It also makes sense that he tried to continue his role as an authority figure since he's the only adult there and the one that would ultimately have to answer questions if they were rescued. But I wonder if this thinking about his regrets regarding his boyfriend is being sparked by things that are happening in the cabin. If this isn't all setting him up to die, then I wonder if it's setting him up to leave that role behind and to echo what he told Paul, start to live his life as he was meant to. Whatever that might mean in this post-cannibalism survival situation that they're in. He's always felt like a bit of an outsider to the rest of the group because of the age difference. Now he is a literal outsider because he didn't eat Jackie. And he used to function in a way that he was their last connection to civilization, if you will. So it's kind of exciting to think about what might happen to him. We didn't get any updates on the hobby situation and generally not much concerning Travis. It seemed a little weird that he didn't go with Nat to the plane in light of the visions he was having with Lottie in their intimate moments, but they were all in a weird way after the banquet, so I'm not sure what to make of it as of yet. I mentioned that they were adding dimensions to some of the characters at different points in this recap, and there was also a lot related to story. Lots of blood, lots of mentions of an it, and lots of references to the symbol. Where last week I was a little put off by the supernatural feeling behind the way they shot the snow dropping on Jackie's funeral pyre. I really like this idea of the blood falling on the symbol on Shauna's baby blanket and then these birds falling from the sky because this is more about how they'll react to that. I wouldn't say they came up with a great rational explanation but things like this do happen and we watched in real time how opinions were divided and they actually split up while some of the people were picking up the birds as offerings. That's a new minor mystery and there's others like the sound of dripping that Mari's hearing. It seems like she's the only one that's hearing that, so I'm not sure where that's going. Walter is fun, but he's also kind of a suspicious character. There's definitely something there as far as why he initially came looking for African Grey. The White Moose could be a new thing. It kind of came and went in the episode itself, but I imagine that there will be more related to that in the future. And the terror that Lottie experienced when she has these visions and what that means about what happened in the past. I mean, the fact that she still uses the symbol, that we see it all over her compound, the fact that we see those antlers outside of her quarters and we see them as part of the design inside, it certainly felt like she was using those experiences to guide what she does with her followers. So this terror, this fear that she's experiencing makes that all a lot more complicated. This character Lisa that Nat stabbed at Lottie's compound is getting a fair amount of screen time. The theory that's been floating around the internet was that this is Shauna's baby because the actor is the right age. The idea being that no one knew Shauna was pregnant, so it would be possible for Lottie to claim the baby was hers when they got rescued. It's mostly a fun theory because there isn't much evidence, and it seemed like it might be debunked after Lottie referred to the baby as a boy. Interesting enough, Nicole Maines, who plays Lisa, is trans, so her being born in the wilderness could still make sense. Now that Nat and Travis are sleeping together, it's even possible that Nat could get pregnant out there. But there would be some explaining that would need to be done for her not to have mentioned anything about the child she gave up to Lottie by this point. I'm very excited to see adult Ty and Van reunite and find out what she's been up to since the rescue. It was a surprise to see the bad one suggest that she go looking for her. With Misty and Walter following the Fanta trail to Lottie, 
it seems like a reasonable guess that Van might want to go there too. Ty left the hospital in a hurry, so I do hope that she didn't forget about Steve and Sammy. I'm also looking forward to more visions and possibly some more unreliable narrators. I like the emphasis on the fact that all of these characters are having a little bit of trouble with their grip on reality. There doesn't seem to be anything that's ongoing. What I mean is here we saw Ben thinking of what might have been, but also by the end of the scene it was clear what was happening. So as long as it doesn't get to a point where nothing matters because we don't know if it's real or not, I'm here for it. And I think that is a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.